Having a museum is, is something very important for the martial arts community. Bruce Lee had made an impact in America, as everybody knows, you know, from the Green Hornet and his films. It wasn't that until Enter the Dragon that changed everything. But unfortunately, he passed away before Enter the Dragon was even released. So he never enjoyed the notoriety he received, never enjoyed the decades, 30, 40 years later, that his name is still out there. This is why it's important that a museum is here, that we can not only remember the legacy of what Bruce Lee did, but now we have Eric Lee, a, someone who's still alive, can now enjoy the impact he's made. We were traveling to an event, and the guy driving the car said, hey, we're going to pick somebody up. We rode up to a curb. He said, Bob, open the door, move over. The trunk lid opened up in the back. Some stuff went in the trunk. The trunk lid closed. Eric Lee got in and sat beside me. We had a great conversation on the way to the event. He's awesome, man. <laughs> I've been following him since I was 10 years, uh, 14 years old. Eric and I have so many memories together. I mean, we've done so many things. We've done uh, movies together. Uh, we've uh, did a tour to China together. We've done seminars. He's a warrior. He's been around forever. He was a hero of mine, and I was just a kid. Well, I'm 85 now, so... How old is Eric? At the time I picked him up in a photograph and he was really impressed by that and, sh and shocked that I could pick him up and hold him in a photograph. He's really small, so it's pretty easy. I hate to say it, but I think I met Eric Lee in the other lifetime. I don't remember the exact date. He used to change my diapers, you know, when I was small. I met Eric Lee several years ago as um, he was walking down the street in Chinatown, and um, he needed a ride, so I haven't, no, I'm just joking. This is a seafood of a good friend of mine, Tony Grosso, president of the LA Base Club, and I knew his wife, he was actually um, a good friend of mine, and so was she, her name is Chris, and they kept talking about Eric Lee, and I think I met him that way, but I'm not really sure because I've known him so long. He's kind of like my brother. <laughs> I think he's just a homeless guy wandering around trying to, you know, impress people. Well, and the problem is, there's nothing he can do to impress anybody. Well, he's probably one of the most widely known martial artists. Uh, he's not just a master, he's a grandmaster in Kung Fu. How can you talk about someone who has over a hundred world titles, who is 25 times Hall of Fame in the team, who knows how to hurt you and heal you at the same time. I uh, traveled all over the world to learn all the martial arts, Kempo, Shotokan, Taekwondo, Greco-Roman, freestyle wrestling, and I traveled right here to Los Angeles, California to be a student of the best. Eric Lee, have you ever heard of him? If you haven't, you're gonna hear from him now. Check it out. Lee left Hong Kong at his father's uh, urging because he was having a lot of problems with the Tong. He was beating up a lot of the gangbangers. Gave him $100 and said, go, and he sent him to Oakland. And there I think he, he established his roots, just like Eric did. They're both proud of their ethnicity, but they're both um, East-West people. I like that. The thing I love about both of them is they understand the Western mentality as well as the Eastern mentality. Both of them outstanding martial artists, both of them charming as heck, both of them could light up a room when they walk in, both of them train to the top level. Very few people can push themselves as hard as they did. Chuck Norris, Gene LaBelle, Bruce Lee, Eric Lee, I mean, those names come to mind. Jim Harris and Pat Rosen. When you think of those phenomenal martial artists who push themselves just a little bit beyond, um, and yet not get egotistical about their skill set. Eric Lee reigned as the King of Kata from 1970 to 1973. During that time, he has also amassed over 100 world titles in Kata competition. I'm Grandmaster Byron Mantek. I represent Okinawa Shoin Rukurate. Uh, my name is Dan Asano, and I uh, start out in Kempo, but I like to train in different martial arts. I always find it very fascinating to train under 
whether it be Chinese or Japanese or Korean or Okinawan or, or Indonesian or Filipino or Thai or you know, Burmese and Cambodian. I just I like it all. I just like studying the martial arts because I think it's like studying the, uh, the history. The martial arts um, have three components to it. One, physical development. Two, mental and spiritual development. And three, to be proficient in competition. And if you take any one of those components from the martial art, then you're not truly a martial artist. You're just someone who practiced martial arts. In, in Philippine martial arts, they refer to the, the title as guru. In Thai, it's ku, or the, what they call a jun. Uh, sifu, if you're in the Chinese martial arts. Sensei, if you're in the Japanese martial arts. Uh, martial art. So there's a lot of different martial arts. So uh, titles, I just like to be called uh, Dan and Dan and Sam. I'm not really too much in the titles, you know. In my humble opinion, uh, Grandmaster Lee's major contribution to martial art is in um, expressing the humility that all martial arts artists should have. Uh, over the years that we have been. Um, affiliated or being uh, around each other, I have come to realize that he is above all others that I have met, the most humble and generous person in the martial art. Eric was born in Changsan Village, Canton Province in China. His family owned two herb shops in Hong Kong and they lived in the back of one of them. Also in the back was a family doctor and a drugstore. Eric, for example, was very much into nutrition. And his father and mother were herbalists. And Bruce was very much into nutrition, and both of them are philosophers, you know, and they bridge the East-West philosophy. Everything is fascinating. That's my China experience. Just go, 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 hyper, and when I was few years old, went to Hong well, Kong, and my father opened the business and support by my grandfather, and he opened two shops. Uh, herbalist, doctor, chef, and the pharmacy, they all lived there. So they would pull out the bed and they would sleep there. The government would take everything from us because <laughs> I was in China. My mom in China and my sister was in China. And my great-grandmother was in China and so we all lived together. Matter of fact, she had her coffin sitting on back of the room. And I keep looking and I say, she's not dead. Why are we having a coffin? Hong Kong was totally British during that time in 1950s. So we are very disciplined. When the teacher comes in, we stand up like this, stand up. And, and the teacher would say, you may sit down now. So we sit down. When you do a wrong, they would punish you. They actually hit you with a stick. In America, it's no, no. My first impression was my dad, and I don't know which one come first, or my grandparent would take me to see Chinese opera, and they were stage martial arts, stage kung fu, so called. And they do rap, and they talk, and they don't sing so much, they rap. So when I come to America, they're still rapping. Kung fu school everywhere, they are mostly uh, traditional. When he had time, Eric would go to the movies and would get inspired by the films of the legendary Quan Duck Hing. And I watched some of the color movie later on, like John Wayne, my, my aunt take me there. She's, she's in the 80s now. She's, everybody thinks she's my wife. As a teen, Eric went to school in Nicaragua before it turned communist. He stayed with friends of his grandparents. It's very hot there and humidity is, is ridiculous. It's 110 degrees, 115, 120 degrees with humidity. There's a gentleman, his name is Sifu Clinton Fong, and he was very good with throwing ducks. And so uh, he, he would teach me how to throw ducks, and I, I, I hit, when the closer, I can hit the pole. There's a big window there, and there's a pole between. So I hit the pole every time, and I got cocky. I went back a few more feet, and I missed it, and boom. The knife would go down and hit a wino. He happened to drink a big, wine over there and then I hit right in that jar and I was fast enough to run over there and catch him and he and he cuts and the other hand I still holding a few more knife he thought I was gonna kill him so he ran I never seen a one who ran so fast in my entire life I just want to know where the knife go and I I saw the picture of my grand 
parents send to me about San Francisco. I always want to go and say, this is so far away as a kid. Everything is, is very, uh, very big. As you get older, everything has become smaller. The family moved the business to Oakland, California. It was here at about age 16 that Eric began his formal martial arts training. Before I, I come to America, just go back track a little bit. And I came with the, what do you call it, the President Line. Those are uh, big ship. Okay, it took like 20 days to get there. So, so we will stay in, I uh, got a little seasick because I was not used to 20 days. And we went to stop in Japan, just going back a little bit. And then all these guys will hang around karaoke bar. And I was the last one in and said, oh, you're just a baby. So I was very young, she put me on the lap and she got big boot. And, and I, I kind of shy, I said, who is this lady? She must be about t at least 20 years older than me. And I was just sitting on her lap. And that was my first experience in sit, sitting on some lady's lap. When I left Central America, my name was Nicaragua, and I came back to this country, I went to school, and this person, a uh, big bully, okay, you, you have that. Big bully, I say, hey, look, and then you go, bang, like that. Chop me right on my throat. And I was there for hours, I couldn't move because, and that was a long time ago. Next day, I, I took, he, took him seriously. I wanted to hurt the guy. And I wanted to be able to really, truly defend myself. And then when my father, after six o'clock, we have dinner and he go out and practice uh, martial arts. He'll come out, the old Sifu will come out and teach him the style called Choi Le Fat. Choi style, Li and Fat is Buddhist style. Actually, three style combined together is Southern style. Actually, he's my inspiration. He's a guy told me, don't do Kung Fu, but he did it. Because all Chinese, they are over there. So when I come to America, everybody is bigger than, than me. So he said, don't do that because you if you learn this stuff, you might get beat up. So I said, okay, father, that's okay. I'm going to do it. So I did. He started under the instruction of Chung Ball and later studied with Al DeCascos from 1968 to 1973, whose style was one-hop kundo kung fu. They had a similar way of thinking when it came to being open enough to accept new and original things. When I went into the school, Al had a lot of students. I didn't know Eric from Teddy, from Mike. They, all, they were just a group of students. I was a new student in the school, and we would all line up, and of course Al put us all together. And I used to wonder, why is this Eric Lee always late to class? Because Al used to make it a point, we had to be on time. But no, Eric was never on time, but yet I knew he was out in the parking lot. But it uh, didn't take long to be able to tell that Eric was truly, um, his, his style, his body movement was somebody that you paid attention to. His, his weapons, his fighting, his self-defense, but when he did a form, it was mesmerizing. I met Eric about uh, 1967, 68. I was uh, asked by Sipu Al to sit in for him because he got called into work. Other instructors included Grandmaster Cher K. Lu, Master Wen Mei Yu, James Lee, and the successor of Dr. Hua Wong. Always training, always had a girlfriend, always had a hot rod. I, I love hot rods. I was a kind of rebel. We race in streets of San Francisco, except we don't go forward. We race reverse going back up the hill. I have no more speed ticket. I did have 21 speed tickets. You know, the Chinese New Year parade and all that stuff, and we participated in it. That time, we had the restaurant. My grandparents only sell roast duck, roast pig, and things like that, and later on become a Lun Key restaurant. My name is Thomas Yu. Every time I go to this restaurant in Chinatown in Oakland, I'm looking at hundreds of trophies in the restaurant. So, wow. 
this is a you know kung fu um, you know master for sure. One four of the customer they were my friends, and so I made a lot of friends. They doing between the break doing the tournament they would come. I think Chuck Norris was there. Ed Parker, uh, Professor Imperado, Adriano Imperado, they were all there. I remember one time this man, I forgot his name, and um, he's like a samurai warrior, you know, so he got like six, seven black belt all holding samurai, so I, I thought they were trying to invade Chinatown. He would walk in the restaurant, all, my, all our customers would leave because they come in with the swords. So he would sit there and he arranged his own table and then all the black belt were behind him. And so the waiter was nervous to serve him because he, he's serious. We eat there all the time, you know, so the foods are good too. After I left, uh, they still think I'm there, my energy is still there, so they continue to become a customer. There were a lot of solid Kung Fu uh, students, but their seafoods didn't put them into tournaments, they kept it private. 1970s, I already studied martial arts for a long time because I already had my degree in auto mechanic. I was living in British Columbia for a short time, that's how I met a uh, good martial artist like Alex Kwok. I was living in Burnaby in the, my uncle's place. At that time I had a girlfriend. I was learning how to play chess and there's a college there and I went to learn chess and I met a good friend of mine, his name's Alan Ng and he happened to be Chinese. And the other guy named also Sam. We have to make a living. I'm too proud to ask my parents for any money. I, I'm not like that. I, I like to make it my own. And we were working for the company and the, the person didn't, didn't pay Alan, Sam or me. So we decided to quit one day. We got a license called Samurai Enterprise. And then uh, we would consign the car. Let's say you want a car for $10,000. Anything about that, we keep. We got like 50 cars, Cadillac, Corvette, Lotus Link. I was driving a different car every day. He said, Eric, wow, you are something else. How can you drive so many cars? I said, uh, this not my car. And we would charge the people 25 bucks during those days. It's a lot of money. So we didn't have a car lot and we have to put all the car on the street. And so we sold a lot of cars and that's how we make a living. And I started to compete in, in those days and then I got a lot of trophies and some of the trophies were sold from high side kick become a low shin kick because it got melted. I've uh, been in martial arts for 50 years. I just hit 50 years about six months ago. I'm a first generation with Ed Parker. State, internationals, the international karate championships is pretty much where he really got his name and and uh, by the performances that he did, you know. So uh, in early in the early days, you know, he was a, uh, you know, he started young, and uh, and he was a great champion. He represented uh, kung fu, yeah, and, and uh, pretty much uh, a lot of the weapons that came out. You know, during that time period in the martial arts, uh, karate tournaments were were still, you know, they started in the 40s and the 50s and so on. And they got very popular in the 60s during the blood and guts era of the point fighting. But there was nothing really a lot for forms. And when you go to a karate tournament, especially back then, and I, myself have been training since the 60s, um, all you say was mostly white uniforms everywhere. You know, and then all of a sudden, here comes this guy in this black outfit coming right onto the tournament floor. Yeah, he outshined everybody. He had these circular movements no one had ever seen. They've all seen these linear style movements everywhere and this very hard style in this kiosk. And all of a sudden, here was this kung fu guy coming out of nowhere and coming onto the tournament floor. As a competitor, I don't like to lose in those days. So I do have somewhat of an ego as a competitor. I didn't want to lose. There's nothing wrong with that. When you know yourself, you know your limits, you know your strengths, you know your weaknesses, you know what you can do and what you can't do, and you totally understand and completely understand that when you look at, when I look at any other martial artist, they have the exact same weaknesses and the exact same strengths. And it's what you do with it. It's, I know that when I've gone into fights, um, I never want to hurt the person that I'm competing against. However, I'm involved in a contact sport. It's a given. You have to. 
in the high school, uh, we met a lot of people, and but in college, that's when I have the club called Laney College in Oakland, California. That's uh, that's why I have an open map and for everybody to come to study and then to share. And uh, so I was fanatic about wanting to be good at something. So my friends would come. I really enjoyed working with him. Uh, he organized a group of people, 20 foot, you know, twin. So we all gathered together, just kind of exchange ideas. And Eric was uh, sort of the, the, the initiator of that. And then we have Taekwondo, boxing, res American res uh, wrestling, Aikido. All kinds of people would come in and share. We have the map, and we also did a lot of demonstration in those days. And so it's a lot of fun. If you want to be a well-rounded martial artist, you can't study one style. You have to study many, 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 and gleam on to whatever you think is best for you, as Bruce Lee would say, and discard the rest because it's truly up to you. Bruce Lee uh, make his mark there, and then he used to come to the Costco school with James Lee and watch us train in those days. He was very serious. He's a very serious man. I never got to train with him, uh, really know him in person. Anyway, and I also knew the guy he fought. His name is Sifu Wong Jackman. And actually, Wong Jackman School is not too far away from my grandparents' uh, restaurant. So I witnessed some of the uh, history where, where Bruce Lee making his mark, and then uh, Wong Jack is not a bad guy at all. He's he, he's just the chosen one, <laughs> so so to speak. And it was a Chinese martial arts community uh, that was very instrumental in both of their developments, you know, as martial artists. It's totally disrespect to put anyone down. I'm not like that. When he first came from Hong Kong, <clears throat> I liked him. I'm a martial artist, and he was better than me. My name is Dan Tosh. Uh, I've been a uh, friend of Eric Lee since uh, about 1981. 1970, Eric walked in the dojo. And uh, what a great uh, personality. Very abrasive, but that was the first time I ever met Eric. Hi, my name is Joe Olivares. I run U.S. Karate and Boxing uh, in Hayward, California. I met Eric in about, in the middle 80s through Sid Campbell. I'm Janet G, and I um, from San Francisco, and I know Eric for God, just in the seventies. Uh, I met Eric about forty years ago when I was in high school. My name is Mike Replogo. I first met Eric Lee about thirty-five years ago. My name is Sipul David De Jesus, or as Eric Lee would like to call me, David J Lee. This is a new name for me. Hello, I'm Sifu Bob Gomez. My name is uh, Frank Manifesto. I met Eric uh, through Nathan LeBlanc. I first met Eric in 1975 when we went on tour. It was called Martial Arts Masters Expo. My name is Michael Milam, and I first met Eric Lee uh, back in 2004. He always comes in being humble. He has no attitude. To say that I know him on a personal level, I don't. I like to. I believe he was a real pioneer back in the day when he uh, demonstrated in karate tournaments the traditional Chinese martial arts and still carries that with him to this day. A mutual friend of ours were throwing together this gathering. and I had the honor of uh, meeting Grandmaster Eric Lee that night because he's been a long time uh, inspiration of mine through the martial arts years. I remember he really got wild when he did his foot when I first saw him do a cut on with strobe lights and you see him move point to point. As a teacher, you're only as good as you can teach and relate to people. So he brings things down to common man's level and they can understand everything. So he's probably the best teacher I've ever seen also. I had a dojo in Hollywood and I was hosting <clears throat> seminars by uh, Professor Ramey Praces and Eric came in to actually attend the seminars. So my first introduction to Eric was, he got there a little bit late, everybody knows Eric, that's no surprise. So I took Eric on the, on the side, caught him up with what was going on in the seminar, which, considering this was uh, sticks and weapons, it took about 30 seconds to get Eric up to speed on what had been going on at that point. Having mastered about 55 or 60 weapons already, this was not a lot of news to him. He was into like metaphysics and quantum, 
mechanics, and a lot of stuff that I was interested in. Eric likes to tell me, um, you need to relax more, you need to relax more, you need to, uh, you need to uh, not work so hard yet achieve more. You very rarely find people like this on this planet that are true to their form, true to the art, committed for a lifetime, and willing to share that information and knowledge with all those that you can find that will receive it. So when we have our talks, um, and, I, and I know that he's been through a lot of, uh, a, a lot of different uh, uh, things in his life, so I listen to him because uh, he has a lot of wisdom that comes with all the stuff he's been through and all the people he knows. When you become a martial artist, at first it's all about the physicality of it. You know, learning to block and learning to move and learning to this and learning that. And then eventually, as a martial artist, when you learn to tear people down, you also have to learn how to build them back up. And I'm not talking emotionally or spiritually, but physically as well. Because, you know, we are not our bodies. We are souls inhabiting these bodies. We don't have a soul. I was a person who, when I was younger, was raised to destroy. He taught me the importance of understanding how to heal what you break or fix what you break, which takes a little bit longer. So to put more thought into what you break. Late sixties, I was doing demonstration on a grass, and that time I was younger, much younger, and with my student. So we dem. So this gentleman with the suit comes on and say, "Hey." Don't do anything right here on the grass. He talked to me like dignitary. I said, who are you? I said, so he said, I'm the head security here. I said, really? So, so why don't you come to my school? And he gave me the card called shirt, and his name is Sid Campbell. And Sensei Sid Campbell, I didn't know what Sensei is in those days. And Sharon Ru, but it's written in English and somewhat Japanese or Chinese, I can read those language a little bit. So he said, why don't you come to my school? So I went to his school. He, he gave me the attitude about him and uh, I was young and fast and, and I don't care, he's bigger than me and by maybe a foot. <laughs> I don't know how tall he is. He's a big guy. So I find out I went to his school and he teaching class and then uh, the time his green bell, his name is El Calavito, Italian guy, and now we're friends, well, we're friends. And then Sid Campbell took me to one small place, it's actually his kitchen, come with me. I said, you go first, because I don't trust him. So during these, those days, I don't really trust him, he, he was a, a karate gi, and I'm a kung fu stylist in those days, and he said, Sit here. I say, don't you think we need more room? He say, what do you mean? Sit here. So he went to the kitchen. He bring, he brought in two beer. Here, have a beer. Now he putting me on. He's, this guy is trying to get me drunk and beat me up. He say, I don't. I, I'm not really into <laughs> to the the beer you into. Can we just talk? You want more space? I need more space. Can we do it? I, st I think he's trying to challenge me. Boy, I was wrong about that. He's just putting on. I find out later on, he's not, he said he he the head security in that place in Oakland Museum. But I find out later on, he's the only guy who worked there. So he's a head, he's a chief, and he's an Indian. Same guy. So we became good friend after all. So we tell a lot of jokes and we did many things after that. I guess that's the lure of a lot of people in martial arts. They were fascinated by seeing something. Eric was fascinated with Chinese weaponry. He made it to be one of his main studies and he became proficient in over 35 different weapons. Back in the old days before 9-11, he'd pack up his, uh, his suitcase. Well, it looked like a, a large violin case, very large, and it's full of weapons. In those days, you could just walk on the plane with it. You, know? you can't do that these days. Yeah, I didn't go to tournament for competition or win trophies, things like that. That's much later. A consummate competitor, Eric would compete at tournaments in three divisions, kata, weapons kata, and sparring. One of his biggest impacts was the use of music in 1970. 
Eric would also add drama and the use of strobe and black lighting effects, fog machines, sound, and comedy. Eric is, will always be known as the king of kata, you know, doing this form. You know, kata, again, is a Japanese terminology. He was known at that time for being flawless in his form. You know, he could do three sections of staff. He could do the Chinese sword. He could do the empty head ball. Chinese sets. During that time period, the only magazines out there were like Black Belt Magazine. So Eric was all over those magazines, uh, Fisher Karate, Black Belt Magazine, and so forth. And, and uh, he represented the Chinese style. And that's one of the things he did. He opened up the, the idea of what the Chinese forms could do. Then after that, when I brought my team up in 73, we continued it. We uh, demonstrated, we were the first one to bring out the two-man sets. We did a lot of demonstrations all over. We competed so much that we won 500 trophies in six months. After that, they would not let us compete. They said, we'll pay you to demonstrate. <laughs> so that's how we sort of got into the entertainment business. I love that he brought the music and open style forms to martial arts. Uh, and I'm personally grateful because before I ever knew he did that, <laughs> I was actually winning gold medals in that discipline. So I love it. I think it's amazing. I didn't even know the rule. I just go to compete um, at the tournaments. And then I didn't know you're supposed to finish in the same direction because Chinese form, I always interested in form, weapon, and fighting. The fighting is more like tag game. It's not a, a, a complete. There are rules, so you hit a not hit a person without being hit again, or you pretend to hit a person. They call it kiss contact or no contact in those days. It's not it's not a real thing. So anyway, there's different tournament have different rules. Some of my associates and I were putting on a um, martial arts show at the sports arena, and. Uh, so we hired one of Eric's friends to be the talent coordinator, and then Eric got, came on board. Next thing I know, we're, we're old buddies from past lives. Who knows how it works out? And then I end up as his roommate for about four or five years up in the Hollywood Hills. And that was an experience. <laughs> I met a competitor such as Joe Lewis and Steve Sander, and later on, I watched them compete, and we compete in, we, we always see each other in the same ring. So I met a lot of good people, uh, Tatashi Yamashita, um, Karen Sherbert, and she said I inspired her to study martial art. I hope that's true, and good for her. And Malia DeCasco, uh, Mark, Mark Dacasco, he star in he's the American Iron Chef, and I think he played low fat in Hawaii Five O, and then low fat, low fat, low whoa. Anyway, he's not fat at all, and I used to take care of him, give him milk. In other word, babysitter. <laughs> we met a lot of good people. I get along with everybody, and that's something that I think that's called martial ethic. I've known Eric about 40 years, or known of Eric for about 44 years. I started competing in 1971, and uh, my primary focus was on sparring at that time. But Eric was already known as the king of kata, or king of forms competition. I started competing in forms myself, and after each Northern California tournament, I would go up to Eric and say, Sir, how can I get better in some kind of way? What do I need to do to improve myself to hopefully be like you? And he would just take the moment and take his time every single time and give me some positive feedback. And those were the seeds that really planted the martial arts for myself and my students and who we are today. Well, Film-wise, I had a probably best known for a movie that in my life called Bloodsport. Jean-Claude Van Damme portrays me in the movie and then they did a sequence of films after that uh, using the same title. I first met uh, Eric Lee uh, years after I first uh, saw him. I actually saw him participate in a demonstration at the University of Southern California with Danny Nasanto. Uh, it was uh, right after the game of death. It was in honoring of Bruce Lee's premiere. I saw him at the premiere. 
and he interested me especially. I watched him do a, a demonstration of a thing called the steel whip. Captivated me. Uh, and that's when I saw also, I think, Cynthia Rothrock for the first time. My title is known as C. Joe, which is known as the founder of the system. My system's known as the White Lotus Kung Fu system. I knew about Eric because he was competing uh, uh, before that time period, you know, all over as the top Kung Fu uh, competitor out there doing forms. And, uh, you know, since my art is Kung Fu, you know, I'm always following people that are out there at that time period. And uh, I, I knew his teacher out at Costco also that was trained that trained him also. So I lo I know a lot of the old pioneer guys, you know, because they considered me one of them also. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I, I met Eric uh, during competition of certain tournaments. I forget which one exactly. I think it was probably up in Oakland area. First time I met him, and then uh, as I start getting more involved after the Kung Fu series, I, uh, the pilot film, I said, we opened up our first studio. So that was in 1973. So in 1973, I formulated my team. That's when I pulled Albert Leong and James Liu as co-captain of my demo team. And that's when we started competing, and that's when we were running the air all the time. <laughs> you used to watch him come, go to the competition, or watch his stuff, and then he'll go back and disappear, go meditate before he goes on the floor. And then, he would come back and uh, he just uh, wowed the audience. You know, he had spectacular movements, you know, smooth, you know, so it, it was something else. The speed was on, uh, during that time period compared to all the other people's form. Ed Parker's international tournaments, the king of kata was the king. It was just tremendous. I remember him being so flexible, you know, and uh, so graceful, nice to watch. You know, I envied the way he, he moved, he moved so smoothly. Well, the first time I saw him, he was a skinny guy, great body, and he was jumping around, jumping up and down. I mean, I've never seen a guy jump so high and be so short. first met Eric, um, actually through a mutual friend of ours, uh, Ed Parker Sr. Uh, I was at his uh, international, Long Beach International Tournament. I compete as tournament all the way from late 60s to 73 and then uh, his favorite restaurant is called Wong Kong in Los Angeles Chinatown and then we joke around a lot because I like jokes and he likes jokes. So we go meet with Ed Parker and here Eric, I barely know him for like about two months, he's telling Ed Parker about all these incredible things that I could do as a martial artist and Ed Parker looks at me and he says, you can do that? And I said, yeah. He goes, oh, I tell you what, if you put a video together and you send it to me, I want to have you perform center stage next year at the International Karate Championships. I was like, oh my God, that was my lifelong dream. That's where my greatest idol, Bruce Lee, became famous, you know, for doing his one-inch punch and whatever happened. One day, he said, Eric, throw me a punch. I said, Mr. Parker, you're older than me. I'm not going to throw a punch at you. That would be totally disrespect for you. He said, no, no, do it slowly, it's okay. So I go like this, like that, very slow. And he go like this, boom, block. He asked me a question, what was that? What is that? And he would say, uh, Ed Parker, Campbell block? I say, no, 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 no. See this ring here? It was given to me by my student, Elvis Presley. I'd grown up you know, seeing him in the magazines, seeing him in some movies at that point, and you know, I already knew who he was as a, as a martial artist and as a pioneer for martial arts. But uh, Ed Parker said, you know, this is Eric Lee, and Eric Lee, this is Alan Woodman. And he took me to Chile, 1986, with a few other people. This is very big. In Ch Chile, in 1986, the sport was soccer. Kickball. In Hong Kong we call kickball and it's one of my sports. The people were very hospitable. And then I walk first and then this gentleman come up and then very dignitary. I say, oh Mr. President. Well, he's not, he's five star general. So we follow him, he opened the door and we got, he got like many camera there, video camera. And we were on all over the South America. We feel like we we're in, like Beatles. Of course we're not Beatles, but the people are just so excited that we are there because uh, his student, Arturo Portit, 
that controlled the sport in that country. The president was a martial artist when he was younger, so he welcomed us and some of us in the film, and we were just anything we do is like magic for them because they never seen it. Later on, Eric was nice enough to I got to travel with Ernie Reyes Jr. and Ernie Reyes Sr. and with Fiamashita and with Bill Wallace, you know, and uh, just enjoyed. Being, Eric was nice enough to bring me on the demonstration team. We went to Mexico together. What was so extraordinary and unusual about it is we've done a lot of demonstrations all over the world. But this is one <laughs> we'll always remember forever. We did the demonstration in a bullfighting ring. <laughs> and uh, we've never ever done that. You know what I'm saying? We thought we'd be on some kind of stage, but here we are in the dirt in the middle of a bull ring. And the most important thing of just that, the vivid memory of us doing that under those conditions, it was more of we were finally at the level of being able to perform with some of the heroes of our martial arts life. And that was again Grandmaster Harry Glee, Tadashi Amashita was there, uh, also um, Ted Cabrera was there. I remember going up to walking up the pyramids, which I thought was pretty good. I remember him saying when he got to the top, I remember, do you feel the energy? It's different, isn't it, on this pyramid? And it really was different. I can't even put my finger on it, but you could, you could feel the energy. Accredited with winning more national and international awards than any other martial artist, Eric Lee retired from active competition in 1973. Aloha. My name is Jimmy Willis. I'm a professor in Kaji Kimbo. I've known Grandmaster Eric Lee for over 30 years. I believe the first time I met him was 1978 at the Oakland Coliseum. That time I was still living in Oakland, California. There's not much going on, and my parents want to give me the restaurant. I, I say, no, I, this is not my thing. So I'd rather be active. So I, I don't want to be locked down in one place. So I went to look for, I was inspired by the actors and in Hollywood and all that stuff, and I got a book. You're right. The action movie, so-called American Golden Age of the Martial Art in 1970, where Bruce Lee's movie like Into the Dragon was showing, they were wrapped around the block twice or three times, and they were very big, and his inspiration for a lot of, lot of people. And I happened to be Lee. And also, so many people have asked me, are you related to Bruce Lee? I say, yes, a few thousand years ago. But war. I was world professional champion, partners with Chuck Norris, who built the largest chain of martial arts schools back in the 60s and the 70s, 182. And I wrote the first who's who in the martial arts. I was in the first uh, Hall of Fame, you know, which there's a million of them now. You can buy your way in in any Hall of Fame, so I never mentioned Hall of Fames. Uh, but then that's basically it. You know, Chuck Norris's partner, I'm the only person to be in all of Bruce Lee's movies. Okay, he's in a movie called Into the Dragon. He's the a bad guy with a scar on the face. If you see the movie again, you see he he's interesting guy. And I Bob has got a lot of spirit and he's uh he's a good martial artist. He liked to fight. <laughs> I first met Eric Lee in uh, 1970. Uh, and Eric, you know, was just one of those talented people that you pay attention to, kind of like Bruce Lee. But I think the fact that he is so widely acclaimed by such a wide amount of martial artists is always very impressive. And it's always impressive because I've been fortunate to know a lot of famous people, you know, from Elvis Jack Pounds, Brian Keith, Paul Newman, Elkie Summers, Steve McQueen, Freddie Prince, Bruce Lee, Chuck Norris, and on and on and on, uh, many of which were training partners or students. And uh, so when you get to know people, it's always nice when you have a celebrity, a well-known person find out that there's substance that they're good human beings. That's Eric Lee. I met uh, Eric Lee, and I'll refer to him from here on in as my Sifu. Um, I met Sifu, I think it was in the late 80s. I had been a big fan of the martial arts, and of course the Bruce Lee you know, films are incredible. And um, I'd seen several magazine covers, Black Belt, Inside Kung Fu, with, with Sifu on them. And I was so, uh, so impressed by, by what I've seen of him. And it just so happened that they were doing a seminar, a Kung Fu seminar, at the World of Bruce Lee Museum. And I saved up my money, I went to the seminar, and I was hooked. My friend's father, he was a movie star back to 1950. Of course, the movie was black and white. And um, those days, the camera 
the movie cameras are really huge, really, really heavy. So you move the actor, you don't move the camera because the camera is too heavy. So he was fighting on the third floor. Uh, on the roof, the third flat, you call. So the break broke. There's a camera underneath there. There's a camera on top on the roof. So those days, there were, I guess, no stunt double. You got to do your own stunt. So what happened, he was fighting on the edge of the, uh, the roof and the brake broke and he flipped and he fell. He landed on hall stands, not even a scratch. So I said, wow, that's amazing. So I met him, uh, his son, his name is Augustine Lamb. Okay, his father, uh, Lamb also, of course, and uh, Lam Gao, and he's passed on now. So oh, that's another impression. This is 1950. He showed me the newspaper, what he did, what he had done, and later on, they developed what he called stunt double because the main character cannot die, but the, the stunt person can replace and double for him for his action. So we have a expo uh, tribute to Bruce Lee that he died. I think July 20th, 1973, and I was uh, competing at the tournament. That's where I met my Stone and Priscilla Presley, Grandmaster June Rees tournament. And so uh, we have a moment of silence that he passed. He passed, and so it was kind of shock. And I won Grand Champion that day for a form or something like that. Uh, Eric took uh, first place, and I took second. And that's where he was crowned uh, Kata King. In fact, one day I asked him, uh, Eric, uh, what makes a good kata player? And he says, the, the, the player that's looking at his imaginary opponent. I said, wow, that's, that's a good answer, Eric. And he went on to say, but a great kata player is when the audience sees that imaginary opponent. Uh, many years later, and Bruce Lee was very... Uh, into the movie and I took over his teaching job. There's a gentleman, his name is Sterling Sullivan. He's a writer, quite intellectual, quite nice guy. He auditioned for Sam Peckinpah's The Killer Elite and caught the acting bug. I happened to film in San Francisco, right? so I never left town to do this movie. I still have to do the audition for the director and this gentleman is a choreographer named Rick Alamini. He's still here. I've been acting for a number of years, and uh, I got here from New York because I was with the New York Shakespeare Festival for about uh, maybe close to five years doing different shows with Joseph Papp. Sidney Poitier came there to do the uh, uh, Raising the Sun film. And I was one of the actors that they picked uh, to head a line. They used other actors there, but I was the only one that had a line. When I went back to uh, Los Angeles, I uh, met Eric Lee in Bill Duke's workshop, and we did a scene together. He was playing the guitar and, uh, in the scene, and uh, we did a scene together, and we became friends. And. Uh, uh, I even worked with him to get an agent, so uh, he asked me to uh, do a scene with him because he's going to get an agent and, you know, to try out for film parts. I was living in San Francisco after the filming movies. I don't like in Los Angeles. So I live over there, but I need a help. So I call Eric Lee. I say, Eric Lee, please, I need a help. And in the morning, I call him maybe 9 o'clock. So he came right then. He got there into San Francisco at 1 or 2 o'clock. He said, God, this is how come it's so fast? He said, I fly over here. Actually, he's driving. And then my first American student, in not, not in Oakland, but in LA, was Bill Duke. He's a wonderful guy. He's a writer, director, and actor. And he done movies such as Car Wash and Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger. When he direct a movie, he take minutes out and say, time out, I'm going to meditate. So the whole cast stop and he just go meditate. 
So that's interesting. Eric and I first met in 1983 on the set of Uncommon Valor in uh, Kauai, Hawaii, Kauai. And uh, we were there uh, filming with Gene Hackman and uh, Randall Tex Cobb, and we were playing Viet Cong soldiers. I think his most significant contribution to martial arts is uh, his real focus on the, the forms and fighting and a lot of his movies that he does. Eric has gone on to appear in many motion pictures since. Most notably, Big Trouble in Little China. Big Trouble in uh, Little China, I think it, 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 they called it. Believe it or not, after you do a film, you forget and you just go on to the next. So when I was working with James Albert, some of the techniques you see in Little uh, Big Trouble in Little China, where they're doing the hook kicks to the walls and stuff, those are part of my choreograph stuff that we did as part of our demo. So we used to do that all the time. Eric uh, James, uh, I heard you did a movie called Big Trouble in Little China, and uh, I want a girl with a green eye. Is that you? That's very good. So keep going with the dialogue. He was having a premiere of a film, I think, in 1984, so I was probably 16 years old. He had invited my teacher, my teacher invited me, and, uh, and I right away got the energy from Eric where you know, he was a star of this film, and yet he had the time for Rick and for me, somebody he had never met. Um, and so we've stayed in touch ever since. Maybe get into the movies, it's nice to see him in the movies. So he had that more to the martial arts. It's interesting, the big movie that everybody know with Big Star, I have a small part, but the movie that I play the lead in is a smaller movie, but nobody knows. So that's okay, it's, at least we have the experience. Who am I? I am the Master Demon. <laughs> Gerald Okomura. He got bald head, so I made a mistake and asked him for uh, a comb. He didn't have one. Because <laughs> I forgot he, he got bald head. Anyway, uh, we did a movie called Weapons of Death, directed by uh, Paul Kiyazi, produced by Rick Seidel, and I happened to play the lead. He was the main star, I was the Fong's lady, and I knew him through Sid Campbell. The first film we worked together originally was called The Last Adventure. He got me as one of the villains. I was named Chong. Then it became Weapons of Death. Gerald Okamura has a lot of great martial art people. Sid Campbell. I carried this duffel bag filled with weapons. Eric and I had a tremendous fight towards the end of the movie. But Chong used two swords. Two swords to kill Eric Lee. But guess what? The King of Kata ruled. I got two swords in my belly. <laughs> That's how we uh, interacted, Eric and I. Chiro is a very nice person. He, he always wear black. He looked like a real tough looking guy, but he's a really nice guy. He's a teddy bear. So we go back a ways. Great guy. Long-time friend, uh, what more can I say? Dragon Fest. I first met Eric Lee at Dragon Fest. Um, I had been traveling with the Bulgarian national team. Uh, we came over for a world championship um, in the U.S. And uh, I have been dreaming to meet Eric Lee since I was nine years old. I went there and he he happened to see a picture of me doing a uh, jumping spin sidekick and that was a conversation starter and we hit it off from there and I've known him now for 20 years. And, and when I think about our relationship throughout and the little things that pop up is him joking all the time. The, mo the most memorable thing about Eric Lee is his sense of humor. 
I think I first met Eric Lee in the 80s. It's when I first started competition, and I came from a small little town, Scranton, Pennsylvania, and I was ranked number one in my region, so I used to read about all these people that I've never seen, and a friend of mine introduced me to him, and I was like so excited, because I was a foreign person, and I was like, this is the king of kata. I couldn't believe it, and I think I was like just so shocked, you know, and I, I couldn't even talk, because I never seen him do anything, but I just knew he was, in my mind, he was the best form competitor person in the world, and I was meeting him, and the first thing he says to me, he goes, hi, Cynthia, he goes, um, do you know why they don't have phone books in China? And I was like, no, I don't. Why? And he goes, because there's too many wings and wongs, and you might wing the wong wong. I mean, who else could say uh, uh, two wongs don't make a white? Funny. Funny. It's <laughs> funny. <laughs> I don't always get his jokes. But they're funny, <laughs> even when I don't get them for some so, reason. Seifert, okay. Eric Lee, no, just, you're just, right no, here. No. Sometimes he harasses me, <laughs> and he goes a mile a minute. So then I learned it's, it's very much like a dad-daughter thing because I'll just start talking to him in Spanish, and he gives up and walks away. <laughs> we kid each other a lot. He has a great sense of humor, although. When he does that Bruce Lee joke about, um, I don't know, something about Bruce Lee saying, uh, oh, no, no, oh, what the, what the, what the, to this day, I don't understand what he's talking about. What is Bruce Lee's favorite hamburger? And it is the wop That joke brings out Eric Lee. Every time I hear something like that, I just think of Eric Lee. I actually had the honor of traveling with him when we did a series of seminars, I think it was like in late 80s, early 90s, we went around the country to about eight different states and I was his uh, uki or his dummy or his assistant, uh, all rolled into one. And that was so memorable because it showed me not only training with him, which was phenomenal, but it showed me the impact he had on all the people around him. And then, and then later on I met a we became boyfriend and girlfriend. Her name is Kay Baxter, very classy lady. And she thicker than me, but I'm taller than her. I am martial artist and she's a bodybuilder, but we both reached the pinnacle of our career. She's in a bodybuilding hall of fame. I'm into martial arts hall of fame. <laughs> the person who's interviewed me now, oh, Sam Oham, He's behind this camera. The movie that Sam Rowe uh, played the lead is called Master Demon. Now it's becoming like a cult film. Kay was in it. Sid Campbell is a good friend of mine. And Joe was the main heavy on that movie. Yeah. Yeah. The Master, Master Demon. Demon. And then uh, she retired and I retired too. So we came together. Uh, unfortunately, she had a car accident a long time ago. She's gone. And then uh... Eric was going through some stuff in his life. And I remember while he's in the middle of it, and, and it was definitely, you know, uh, concern and, and maybe even suffering with it. As he's in the midst of it, he's thinking, how I can't wait to be on the other side so I can help other people with this same thing. And I, I was, I thought, boy, I'd really like to be able to do that instead of looking at my, my trials as something I have to beat and I can't wait to get past it is, I hope I can teach somebody what I've learned. So that's a, that's a memory I won't forget and, and it served me well. I, I was in a movie called Rambo and I was in one of the James Bond movie, not, whole, not a big whole lot, Timothy Dalton, James Bond movie. I was in a movie with Kurt Russell. <laughs> Big Trouble in Little China, and I was in. I did a lot of stunt work and a lot of looping also, and uh, so many, like Armageddon. <laughs> Bruce Willis, very nice lady, black lady, very very nice. Her name is Barbara Harris, Barbara Harris, and I today I really thank her for giving me the opportunity to learn the skill. He pioneered his own films like uh, Master Demon. Uh, he and I had a great uh, opportunity to work together um, and he asked me to, to come into a film with uh, Cynthia Rothrock called Sworn Justice and uh, he and I got to work together and we choreographed uh, some of the fight scenes for that film. So you know, a lot of people think of me more as a, a screenwriter, I've done some producing too. 
Uh, but mostly screen. I had a kid storyteller. And I made a whole bunch of movies, a handful with Eric Lee. I think I met Eric back in the 90s. Maybe 1992, around that time, I think I met Eric, or maybe even before that. Ring of Fire 2, I think it was one of them, yeah. Around right about the time, PM Entertainment, we ended up doing a film called Ring of Fire 2 together, along with a whole bunch of other martial artists. Don't worry about it. Wilson. Why did you stop? I didn't know. It became a very popular film. In fact, uh, that year, um, it was the most popular film they did, actually, I remember. They are very, very, very happy with everybody. Eric has a lot of heart, and that's what I remember mostly about Eric. I work with many other people, uh, name, no name, it doesn't make any difference. When Michael Jackson was young, young, youngster, uh, him and I did something for Francis Ford Coppola. Michael always liked movement, and I happened to be active. So we did something for Disneyland, but it never showed. It was a spear poking towards the screen. It's too dangerous. People might react, overreact to that, that kind of thing. And so they decided not to show it. We were doing an event in San Antonio, Texas, and um, we all stayed at one house. And I was like, okay, how's that going to work? You know, because it was all these guys, and then there was me, and then there was, you know, uh, Mary Molina was there. And they said, oh, yeah, don't worry about it. And they were all sitting on the couch, and I was really tired, and they were watching Yip Man. And uh, I already saw it, but I fell asleep, you know. So the next day, we're all, you know, at this tournament, and Eric gets on the microphone, and he goes, do you know Cynthia smiles when she's sleeping? And everybody looked at us like, whoa, what were you two doing? The lady lived across the street. She's 98 years old. She's... And I really, she inspired me. Every now and then we play bingo and, and we have uh, parties. Come join us. 90 years old. Many people have gone before me and I'm not that old. And at least 65 of them are gone already. And many, half of them are younger than me. It's a sad thing. So we got to stay healthy. You hear that? Stay healthy. What Eric Lee did is he changed America. For the Martial Arts History Museum, we look at people that made history, that made an impact on America, that have taken a new direction to the martial arts, and that's what Eric Lee did. He wasn't just a guy who won trophies. He was a guy that opened the new doors of opportunity. You know, Kung Fu wasn't allowed to be taught here, as most people know, to non-Chinese. It wasn't until 1959, 1960, Arpa Wong. But, you know, there's t only a 10-year gap after that started, you know, of Americans, and especially some non-Chinese, were not even allowed to learn Kung Fu. Ten years it took to someone to really take it onto the tournament floor, and not just take it onto the floor to make an impact. This was an impact Eric Lee made. He changed everything. He made uh, uniqueness out of his form. He added circular motion. He opened new avenues of understanding in forms and competition. You know, not everybody's fit for a particular style, but when they see the options available, they say, I might want to look in this style. Eric Lee provided that option. My name is Gokor Chivichian. You are in the Hayastan MMA Academy. I met Eric Lee very, very long time ago. I don't really know exactly how long ago, but I know a um, long time ago. Uh, right away, I know he's a very, very good person. He come and train with us, and he, he's doing a grappling, and looks like he he understands the grappling, he knows the grappling. Then I see him with the swords and everything. He's doing good. He's a good martial artist. He's a, he's a professor of the martial arts. Eric Lee now does occasional seminars, and you can find him teaching a small number hey. of advanced students. <laughs> Sifu and I were training one night when we were training at Plummer Park over off Fountain. It's years ago. Nobody showed up. And we were training, and he was watching me. Then all of a sudden, he says to me, this is after I got my second degree black belt under him. He said to me, he looked, he was watching me, now all of a sudden he just says to me, your Kung Fu has changed. I go, what do you mean, Sifu? I think you finally got it. He's very friendly, he's very sociable. 
I mean, he's sociable with everybody. He's not. He teaches me how to relax and how to heal and, and, and about my health. So this is between me and him. He's trying to help me with my health as well as his own. So. I was fighting in Muay Thai, and I needed something a little calmer for my personality when I was younger. I did not like doing things slow, and I was headstrong. He, Low. we were doing the crane, and Low. he was insistent that I had weight on my front foot, and I was insistent that I did not. And we did not train in a gym. We never have. I've always been blessed to train outside with him. And he proved to me I had weight on my foot when he dropped me to the concrete. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are, right, especially now, I'm beyond fighting. I'm more into peace, happiness, health, friendship, more than the ego, more than the title, more than money, more than identity. Been there, done that, so we move on. I got 26 or 27 instruments right now. That is the replacement of my inspiration to learn some new craft. So I have a lot of reason to get off the bed in the morning. Nowadays, we're doing a lot of things for other people because I like to give back to the people. So we like to share what we know to the people that might be interested in what we do. <laughs> Eric Lee is an amazing individual. We flew all the way to uh, New Jersey. We had an event. We went with Bob Wall. And uh, we flew all the way back to California, to LA. We just got off the airplane. And when we get to his house, he said, let's go up mountain climbing. So we went all the way up the hill with hardly any sleep, leg of sleep, nothing to do. And he decides, let's go hiking. This guy has so much energy. I'm just really impressed. I call him the Eric Lee limousine tour. <laughs> he had about um, no, 15 people or 14 people in this limousine. I was invited as a guest. And we went to tour all over San Francisco. We had lunch. And all these grandmasters were there in his car. My little dog came too. Afterward, Eric also treat you for a nice dim sum, you know, or a nice dinner. So his life brought it to me. The last few months, uh, I've been having this birthday party for friends, and then uh, the people born in the same month. We supply the cake, we do the potluck, so every one happy family. And I was very impressed by his reputation because I had I had seen a couple of films and I had seen pictures of uh, Eric in Black Belt magazine. I was impressed with his his warmth and generosity. But as I get to know him more, he has such a way of integrating people, combining. People. Eric has got to be one of the warmest people. Uh, but you can tell by the gathering. I mean, this was his idea to have a, a birthday cake every month or so for people who are celebrating their birthday of that particular month. I came out here to do a series. I was co-starring with James Earl Jones and I met a gentleman by the name of Benny the Jet Bakitas, who was a six-time world champ kickboxer. And he had introduced me to Eric. Because of him, we met a lot of uh, different martial artists. Uh, he introduced me to uh, Benny Yukitas. Because him and Benny used to be uh, do a lot of demonstration at international. Hi, I gotta get up I'm Thunder and Iron Horse. For those that are listening, know me as Benny the Jet. Well, Benny would use Eric, Eric would use him. They would do fighting techniques and stuff. So uh, they're, they're so fast, you know, same size, they were moving, you know, like lightning. So the only two of you could actually uh, uh, do some spectacular techniques. Anyway, I'm here, it's about my, my friend, Eric Lee, first of all. Uh, he's actually my hero, to tell you the truth. We go back in the 60s, Eric and I, uh, back to 65, and I had the opportunity to watch him compete and to watch him perform. I was really had the opportunity not only just to watch him compete and compete with him, but to travel. We travel all over the world together. Matter of fact, we've done seminars together. You know, he started off, I ended, I started off, he ended. And the good part about it was, is we have common belief, which is internal. Internal 
It's about an understanding. It's like turning yourself inside out. This is what Eric was teaching, is what I was teaching, is to turn people inside out that you may uh, see your truth. And the red is a fiery color, meaning hey, to have courage to come forward, to stay in your fear. 10 seconds, that's all it takes, is to stay in it, 10 seconds. A, to be able to change your life. And black is the mastery. Learning how to master yourself. Forget mastery, period, but to learn how to master yourself. And Eric is exactly that. He's about those. He's about truthfulness. A, he's about fire of honesty, of courage. And truly, he's a master within himself. As he once said to me, that we're here for a short amount of time. We're camping out. And as we're camping out, the journey is stronger than the destiny. And I believe that I should say the act is stronger than the doing. Same philosophy of same understanding. The most important ball of Eric Lee. So Eric, I love you. Keep doing what you're doing because again, you came here for a purpose and reasoning and you sure gave it to everybody. Continue leaving your legacy a, of words while you're alive, that everybody can ask you your purpose and reason why you do exist. Uh, that they were friends all the time. And, you know, we still remain friends now. You know, I've just seen Benny not too long ago. So, you know, we always talk about the good old times, you know, back in the days. And Benny just put out his new book and they listed my name as one of the guys that influenced his style. So that was kind of nice also. Many years had gone by and I look at myself, what makes a person healthy and harmony and peaceful. And I look at my yard on the back, the trees, the flowers, I'm complete with them, harmonized. It's not work. They, when I look at them, I like them. So it's a feeling, feeling for healing. Okay, in martial arts, we have, if you learn how to hit, you have to learn how to heal. The sword is all wrist. We kind of have a bonding together, even though Eric is a lot older than me. Uh, we have this bond that, you know, none of us, uh, you know, either of us are, are going to get old and we're constantly going to keep doing things and be energetic. And, and that's what I love about him is that he's constantly doing something, whether it's learning a new musical instrument or, or selling this or traveling here. And whenever he says he's going to do something, I go, yeah, 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 all right, fine. And the thing gets done. How the hell did that work? First time I went to China tour with Cynthia Rothrat and she was my co-host at Bob Wall Initiator. First couple of times I learned the rope, where to go, this and that, and I enjoy doing it and it's, everything is new. I enjoy people that having the smiling faces on them because not everybody go to China or step outside of the comfort zone. I've been in China many times. China, remember China? The Shaolin restaurant. The Shaolin restaurant, yeah. <laughs> Sifu is the loudest. <laughs> he is the loudest. But he got everybody uh, to shout loud. And it was it made it uh, very fun for us because uh, he had the whole restaurant rocking. <laughs> rocking and rolling. <laughs> yeah, that was the first time I heard his Bruce Lee joke. No way. His water joke? Really? The house is still there where I was born. So we can do some martial art and it's kind of old, it's over 100 years old. One time we were sitting in the bridge, so somebody was Chuck Norris and somebody come for two hours, he was rambling on how great his instructor is. And I'm sure whoever that, whoever his instructor is, have a big impression on him and change his life, you know, which I understand. So I look at Chuck and then uh, he look at me and he says something to that person. Um, you speak highly of your instructor. And in reality, it's true because his instructor means a lot to him, so we understand it. The attitude towards respecting other people that permeates my wife, Chuck Norris, Bruce Lee, Eric Lee, those folks have that so much commonality 
you know, so I've always uh, been attracted to those kind of people. He's very kind, he's very tough. <laughs> Nobody you want to try to steal his wealth. Uh, I'm the founder of the Worldwide Martial Art Council. Um, it has united many great people like Richard Norton, Alan Goldberg. We have uh, an incredible council. Also, Eric Lee is part of our board. Sam Kwok is a part of the board. Cynthia Rothrock is part of our board. At that time, my sister um, wasn't doing too well and she had cancer. And I'll never forget, I've asked all these people to sign her certificate before her dying on the side of the bed. And, Gra and Grandmaster Eric Lee was one of those kind hearted people who signed it. And I'll never forget that day. And um, so we started there, and, and then many other events from the 90s to the 2000s and so on. Uh, in a time where there's a lot of rivalry between different martial arts, you know, between uh, Japanese, Chinese, and Korean martial arts, you know. Uh, Eric is, is pretty easy to get along with and uh, I never felt that, you know, that uh, thing that you might feel against with other martial arts. I always felt uh, very, he's very easy to reach, very easy to talk to. He definitely is an ambassador, for, uh, I would call him the ambassador for martial arts. So he can bridge the barrier between uh, Chinese, Hawaiian, Kempo, Japanese, Korean, Filipino, Thai, I think he, he bridges it pretty good and people feel very comfortable with very My respect for my Sifu is tremendous because I really think he is deserving of the Grandmaster title and sort of beyond that. He not only has, he continually studies and learns a variety of forms and respects them all and never ceases to stop learning. I think that the philosophy that we are always students is what he really contributes so that we never stop learning. That's why when I see martial artists, black belt, they, they, they said, oh, I study this style, this and that. I say, okay, let's not talk about movement. If somebody hits you by two by four, what style is that? Can I say this? Home Depot. You know, though I excelled in, in, in the art that I was in, in kickboxing and kung fu, he excelled in the wushu that he was doing, and um, I think just seeing each other as for who we really are as equals. Being a Chinaman, coming here to the States, um, getting into martial arts and doing the tournaments that he was doing and performing the way he has, has really opened people's eyes to what they can do, and I think that's most important. Even though we all love him as a person, he is one of the best martial art grandmasters in the world. And his techniques are so good, his movement is so good, and he shares it, he shares it with everybody. So I think uh, his contribution is, is his knowledge, his teaching that has helped, I'd say, probably thousands of people all around the world improve their techniques as martial artists and just to learn more uh, in, in martial arts that, you know, everybody at one point, I think, has studied or learned something from Eric. He's one of the few martial artists that probably stayed in shape. A lot of us get old and when we got to that certain age where we didn't, we didn't feel like working out as much, but Eric seems to always stay in shape. He watches his diet, you know, he's, he's eternally young, I think, you know. Good motivational uh, motivation for me to watch him because you know, he never really stops uh, training and he's taking really good care of his body you know it's just evident when you see him now you know. he's still around a lot of people either through injury or through whatever reason are no longer in the field eric's still very active in the field i pray that he can live to be 120 because he he contributes so much to not only the martial artists but to humanity he uses oriental procedures. He has a huge background because his father was an herbalist. So I think that the Eastern principles of his um, being, he brings out that in people. He helps you calm down in an Eastern way. You know, if one of my kids is sick or, you know, twisted their elbow, neck, knee, whatever, then Eric Lee. And he knows what to do and he knows the herbs to give and 
he knows who to point you to and that these are the things I I just remember about him and his smile. Hollywood in the world is better off with him being here. It could be an empty hole in the space if he were not here. All right? And he's humble. <laughs> so we have to kind of uh, uh, do a little PR for him. I wish he just continues doing what he's doing. Because what he does is bring a lot of people together. And by bringing people together, we enjoy our times together. We enjoy our communication, our dialogue, you know, wherever we are, our laughter, our fun. He is a grandmaster, and yet he is so approachable and down to earth, you can call him by his first name, Eric. In order to be a true master, you must think you aren't a master and continually work on yourself and continually learn and continually embrace new ideologies or at least explore them. I'm self-taught, so he taught me in many ways by his example of how to be the master, how to, how to reach the next level of, of growth in my essence as a human being. Eric is my friend. As simple as that. He's the only one to get me out to do forms. I do the ACU. 1996, uh, like I said, we met. I understand him. I, uh, my relationship more for him is being a, a fellow martial artist and a friend. I really love Jackie Chan, but Eric is always going to be my favorite martial artist star. <laughs> you know, I imagine, and, and I was there, but he was there before me, that he went through obstacles. Not everybody understood Kung Fu. Everybody thought it was just, they call it soft style. How insulting is that? You know, they call it, you know, it was, they lumped him into categories against other karate guys. You know, this is things, barriers that Eric Lee had to overcome. And it was just Eric Lee. It wasn't like there were a bunch of Kung Fu guys coming at that in the early, early 70s. It was just Eric. Eric was out there and he alone broke the mold. He set a new standard and paved a new avenue, a new street for everybody else. Like so many great people before him, Bruce Lee and Fumio Kimura and other people, paved the way for karate in America, or Bruce Lee opened the doors for martial arts on film and TV. Eric paved that way for everybody else as well. He became and, and should be listed among the greats of legendary pioneers. And he's down to earth, he's got a heart of gold. I mean, he's, uh, he's just a generous person. As a martial arts icon, Eric is still very active in the martial arts community as a martial artist. He's in his late 60s, and he does things that people are doing in their 20s and 30s of today. So he contributes a lot in martial arts. If it wasn't for Eric, what he does, I think you got more people motivated to do martial arts and want to learn and become an Eric. Eric's my role model. I want to be like Eric myself. Eric is genuine, real, honest, ethical, never turns his back on his friends and is 100% uh, someone that I would count on. I just want to say I'm continually humbled by the graciousness of my friends. In my day, I was known as an intimidator. I was also known as animal to a lot of people. Uh, I got disqualified probably more than anybody I ever knew uh, because uh, I was that type of a fighter. You know, we've just been real close in that aspect. I know a different part of Eric Lee than what you know. He basically, you know, he prays to the Lord, you know, for guidance, just like myself and, uh, and all believers. Um, it's not about religion, it's about a relationship. I make plans with a tree, with a musical instrument. You can see someone on my background. I try to make friends with people. Prosperity and happiness. Unfortunately, not everybody want to be friend. So there's an old saying, if I'm dead laying my coffin, I don't want a whole bunch of enemy and stick on my needle on me when I'm not able to defend myself. So why go there while you're still alive? So we don't want to talk about how tough we are, how good we are, What's my style is better than yours, that kind of thing. 
that's too old already this is that's the past okay we have to make friends make peace love more than it more than who can kick whose butt that kind of thing one thing about eric is he's never forgotten his roots of where he came from and i know that because again uh, Grandmaster Mark Gary and himself always made sure that the old, old school pioneers and pioneers of martial arts in America were always remembered and never forgotten. He promotes and recognizes a lot of martial artists and he does what he can to move them forward in some direction and he always gives some information to enhance somebody's martial arts ability. He's one of the true martial artists. He's still in the circuit. I don't think there is anybody out there that doesn't respect his knowledge. I'm just honored to be his friend and Ohana. He's a part of our family. He's like a brother. He's like a brother to me in the martial arts. Eric is just like a brother to me. I mean, we know each other, you know, we share a lot of good time, bad time, you know. Uh, even, when, you know, when his girlfriend passed away, different things like that. And, you know, even when my father passed away, he, he called and, and, and wanted, you know, send condolences and stuff like this. But, you know, why have a big air about yourself? You know, you're just human, just like the next person. And we're only here for a limited time, so man, enjoy and spread your love. That's all you can do. Life is fulfilling. Because he is himself, he's a lot better off. Because now he can acknowledge he is Eric Lee, the great person. I think he's some immortal god from China and America. Uh, it just kind of sent to this earth as a crazy person to explore and to find out who you are. If, if Eric can tell you who you are, then you have something. Listen to him. Goodbye. It's that trying to say we can do as much as possible for so Eric Lee. I'm going to do it for him because we go way back a long time. How y'all doing? <laughs> How's your mom or him? Oh, wait, no, wait, wait, wait. Start. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. All right. Okay. Scratch. Yeah. I, I know more than finish my deal with Chuck Hall with Chuck York. And, you know, he usually just has little windows with his 14 year old twins. Nice to meet you, Cher. Um, Sunny's a Miss Angie Jack Russell. Cher is a rat terrier. I adopted these two guys, they're amazing. Sunlight. Wonderful smile. It's contagious. Carlos, I'm already 20 minutes late for Eric. He was 20 minutes late to get here and it messed up my whole schedule. Hold it down! So, let me tell you a little something. Youngins, you better save your money because you're going to live to be very old just from getting the knowledge from Eric Lee. I plan to live to be 150 because I know the secrets, and I like to tell them to you now, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Sifu, 40 more years, Sifu. <laughs> I, I definitely believe that Eric Lee is insane. <laughs> I think he got out of the mental hospital actually a long time ago, and he never really recovered. Such a playboy. He loved the girls, especially if they had blonde hair. And Eric was always out there flirting. And he'd come strut me in the class a little bit late. When we were at a massage parlor in San Gabriel, Sifu was um, showing his dexterity and jumping from massage table to massage table to massage table. Yeah, mm -hmm. And my friend with us, who is not a martial artist, I'm just like, okay, I think I just broke something for him. <laughs> Sam Oham, but he can cook, so we call him Sam Cook. We <laughs> <laughs> put that on tape. <laughs> oh my god. You can add the hour if you want. Alright, that's great, that's all, all we right. need. Thank you so much. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, all right, I'm leaving now.